This is Selma Schimmel, and you are looking live at the great city of Chicago, which is once again playing host to the American Society of Clinical Oncology, ASCO. This is ASCO's 49th annual meeting, and this year's theme could not be more appropriate, Building Bridges to Conquer Cancer. More than 30,000 of the world's foremost cancer specialists are here, and so is the group room, making our 15th appearance at ASCO and one of our very best. Joining me now is Dr. Thomas Smith, Harry J. Duffy, family professor of palliative medicine and oncology at Johns Hopkins Medicine. Thank you. With the growing dialogue surrounding palliative care, what role do you see it playing in clinical practice today? So just as your productions are growing, palliative care is growing too. We've gone from a handful of programs 20 years ago to now 80 to 90 percent of large hospitals have programs. And this can typically include a physician, nurse practitioner or physician's associate, chaplain, pharmacist, psychologist, social worker, a mix of all those. It varies from what the hospital can support and what's available. But I think palliative care is one of those few parts of American medicine that seems to work pretty well in that when palliative care is involved with oncology patients, patients have better symptom management, less pain, less shortness of breath. They have better quality of life when we measure it formally. They have less anxiety and less depression. Their caregivers have less distress and less post-traumatic stress disorder. We find out what people's choices are if it is an end-of-life situation where they want to be usually it's at home, not in the ICU or in the hospital, and try to make a plan to honor those choices. We have a chance to monitor and reduce spiritual distress. It turns out that about 90% of cancer patients want us to, at least to know about their spiritual history and to help if we can. We have a chance to help people make a life review or a legacy, what it is that's important about them that they want to pass on to the next generation. And the amazing thing is that it doesn't cost additional money. It's one of the few things that you can show better quality of care, better quality of life, at no additional expense or even some cost savings. When you were saying that, I was thinking about the value in cancer care mm -hmm. in the sense of it actually reducing unnecessary costs. It reduces unnecessary costs, but it also reduces unnecessary suffering. So none of us got into this field to save money. Um, we all got into this field to help people with symptoms. And our symptom charts from the time we first see people to 48 hours later or a week later look exactly the same as MD Anderson's or Mount Sinai's in New York. All the symptoms start here. And when you have another team whose job it is to find out what those symptoms are, and then fix them, all the symptoms go down. So pain, down. Depression, down. Anxiety, down. Every single symptom. It's about the value of, of life. It is. I would like people to live every day until they die from whatever they're going to die from and not be strangled with fear, strangled with anxiety, not be <laughs> So just think that they can't even address any of these issues, we can help with that. As a palliative care person, I have a different note, I have a different script. I say, well, if we're talking about third-line chemotherapy for breast cancer that's grown to, through two different types of chemotherapy, we'll hope for the best, and we should plan for some other medical circumstances too. Not but, but and. Um, do you have a will? Safe and easy question. And she's thinking, does this mean I'm going to die? And I would say, well, tell me more. Is it important for you to know that? What do you think? How long do you think that you would have to live? And again, that's not two-minute conversation. It's a terrible conversation to have with any person, any human being that you feel for. Um, 
it's really hard for a lot of oncologists because we don't get that sort of training in our, but it, in palliative care, we have a script or do you have a will? Do you have a living will or advanced directive? Right now you can make decisions for yourself, but what if you couldn't? Who would you want to speak for you? Okay, it's your husband. Well, what's, what's his cell phone number? And I'll be typing it into the electronic medical record. Are there any family issues that you need to settle? Are there any religious or spiritual issues that you need to settle? Because in my experience, it's much better to do these things while you're still well. You're picking up your kids at 3.30 this afternoon and then go to the park and run around with them. It's much easier to do all these things when you're still well. And let's think about creating a legacy for you, whether it's DVDs or notes, tape recorded messages. Let's think about doing that now while you're still very well. There are probably some other things that you might want to do too if you're like every other person that I've known. You have a box of pictures, probably some old Polaroids that you may be the only person who knows who those folks are. And that's a good, now's a good time to start sorting through all that sort of stuff. It's also a great way to involve your family in figuring out what your legacy will be and get them involved. So those are all the sorts of things that we might do as a palliative care people. And I've got a social worker to help me. I've got a nurse practitioner that I share this either dread burden or wonderful opportunity with who's really good at these things. I have a psychologist available at Johns Hopkins who's terrific at helping people adjust. You know, this person doesn't have schizophrenia or manic depressive disorder, which is what most psychiatrists are trained to deal with. This person has been dealt a terrible deck of cards and instead of living to be 77 is going to be dead by 37 almost certainly. And that sort of adjustment is something that a psychologist needs to be able to handle. And we can help them with some spiritual issues too. As I mentioned before, in the, the most recent study that Tracy and Mike Balboni did from, from Boston, 86% of patients want us to know about their spiritual needs, 86%. And I believe it was 6% of us actually asked. <laughs> Lord knows my patients don't want me helping them with spiritual issues. That's ticket to hell right there. <laughs> um, but what they may help, they, what patients may need help with is identifying that spirituality is even important to them because they may not have thought about it. Or if we share with them what we're thinking their prognosis is, so we're telling them it's three months rather than three years or 30 years, if we're honest with them and telling them what the prognosis is, then they may say, well, I need to go talk to my minister, my iman, my rabbi, my priest. I should start doing some of that now. To which I would say, absolutely. Do things now while you have the energy. And some of my oncology colleagues will say, well, don't people get upset if you underestimate how long they have to live? and they're still here three years from now. She gets a dramatic response to a clinical trial and she's doing great three years from now. I have yet to have a patient or family come back and say, you made me go talk to my priest or my rabbi and make, make peace with my brother in LA. That was the worst thing that ever happened to me. Most of the time people say, thank you. First, I wanna say thank you. I'm sorry? I wanna say thank you oh. first. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, Dr. Thomas Smith, the Harry J. Duffy family a professor of palliative and oncology medicine at Johns Hopkins Medicine. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Smith.